Welcome to another episode of In Range. We're here in Parma, Idaho at the Parma Rod and Gun Club where we have completed High Desert Brutality 2023. And we're not here to talk about the match, but we are here to talk about our rifle optics and sighting systems, right? Yep. So the reason this came about is when I asked my Patreon supporters, what optic should I use on the 20 inch, what would Stoner do carbine? I did a poll and the poll overwhelmingly won the old school 4X ACOG, which is what you see on here right now. And that was interesting because I mentioned in the poll that there were targets out to 500 yards or further. To be honest, I'm like, well, I understand. It's a historic optic. People want to see historic optics, but it felt a little bit like sabotage because everyone's going to have something like what you got. What do you got there? Uh, I have the Sig Sauer Tango MSR 1 to 10 front focal plane uh, with a 5.56 BDC reticle in it. To the audience, explain front focal plane. So the, the, the plane. easiest way to uh, describe it is that the reticle changes size with the magnification. So the benefit to that is that your ranging and BDC works regardless of the magnification you're shooting at. Um, where that's helpful is in stages like this, open environment, you kind of want to have the magnification set so you can see the next target you're going to. You don't want to be too zoomed in. Um, the downside with second focal plane optics is that the BDC only works on the maximum magnification most of the time. So if it's one to six, your BDC only works on six power. So quite frequently at this event, I was shooting at three to five power, never all the way up to 10, mm -hmm. never even above six out here, mm -hmm. but my BDC worked uh, because the reticle scaled with the magnification. So on a second focal plane, if you'd zoomed in, you would have had better visual acuity of the target, but the BDC not moving with your magnification would have meant it was no longer calibrated nor accurate. Correct. You have to, to guess your holds or do a, a different derivative of math on how your holds would work at that different magnification. Which is a terrible thing to try to do on the clock when you've got 240 seconds to drag a dummy and hit a 500-yard target right. from multiple positions. Right. So what I will say is the BDC with 55 grain and this 20-inch barrel was like dead on. Yep. I had, I had zero issues with um, the optic ammunition and rifle hitting the targets. I wasn't hitting... It was me shaking, moving around, not having an optimal, stable position on the stage. So. so on that note, I zeroed because I am an old school high power shooter and I still believe in the supremacy of the Mark 262 77 grain. I shot Mark 262 77 grain ammunition forever. I understand that round, I understand that bullet. I like the ballistic coefficient that it provides. And I zeroed this old school 4X ACOG at 100 yards with Mark 262 77 grain ammo and believe it or not the ballistic arc of that is close enough to m855 which is what this is calibrated for with with uh, 62 grain bullets is close enough that the readings on it of one two three four five absolutely worked like with the miniest minorest of differences so from a fixed forex perspective you get the better ballistic coefficient of the mark 262 and with this acog that bdc was on and you could see that in the footage when i was shooting right yep you're like 300 bing 400 bing 500 bing and it's just put the line over the line and pull the trigger so in that regard this is a smaller very durable optic i'm sure that six hours pretty durable we unintentionally drop tested it twice out here twice and it held up yep. so if this did as well as it did for me which by the way it wasn't sabotage this was actually excellent this was a very good configuration. I'll talk more about that in a minute. And I did very well with this. But it did leave some things off the table that you were able to do that I couldn't do. Right. So I think the biggest difference, just based on our equipment choices, was that things under 100 yards, mm. it was easier for me to transition targets, easier to track moving targets. Mm -hmm. And in fact, that's where I got the biggest advantage on you over on one stage, was shooting out of the back of the moving truck. Yeah. So we had, you and I were like 20 seconds apart. Which for me is a good shooting day because mm -hmm. you you're, you shoot all the time. And so I was doing very well. We had one stage where you shot out the back of a moving vehicle and there were 100-yard targets where if you could hit them on the move in this dust cloud, you got 10-second bonus each. For each hit, yep. I have only one optic sighting system on this gun, which is a fixed 4X magnification. And so all I could do is sort of just point in the direction of the target and press the trigger. Mm -hmm. And I got one hit. Right. But you, you zoomed down to one. Yeah, I started on one power and just bracketed the target with the horseshoe and let loose. And you got eight. Eight hits. Which gave you an 80 second bonus. 80 second bonus. Right. So what we see on the table here is 
that your ability to go down to one was actually maybe more important than your ability to go to 10. Yeah, the, the 10 power, and this is the case, I, you know, we reviewed the Razer HD Gen 3 on the channel, 1 to 10. We've used some expensive 1 to 8s and 1 to 10s before too. Above 6 power, with all these optics with this huge uh, magnification range, you have to focus it differently for the upper end of the magnification. So on this optic, actually 0 to 10 power, all the way in. But my focus is with the diopter dialed all the way in for 10 power to actually be able to see it clearly. Mm. Uh, to shoot below 6, I have a different focal point with the diopter. And I have it a turn and a half out, and I have the bezel marked with a Sharpie mark so I know where to put it when I'm shooting at 6 and below. And I shot the whole match at under 6 power here. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't even think I went to 6. I think I was at 5 at the most on these stages. Which is again and again and again, historically speaking, we see for a... Not a sniper or a DMR per se, but for a combat optic, we consistently see, and with DMRs in World War II and beyond, 3.5 to 4x is almost always the sweet spot. You very rarely see anyone go out of the 4x magnification spot. And when you're using an LPVO, at least at this match, where we're engaging to no further than 500, you found 4 to 5 to be the right number. Right. The only time I've found 10 power to be useful is like, observing and spotting so ironically when i'm helping ro the stages and we didn't have all our equipment set in place and all the spotting scopes set up ad hoc went down on the stage dialed up to 10 power focused for it and observed people's hits through my mm -hmm. one to ten scope as a spotting scope uh for the you know watching their long range target engagements and that's something you can do with this and that's the reason like in real field conditions combat or otherwise your variability of 1 to 10x allows you to carry this as an observation device, not having a spare set of binoculars, for example. Right. I'm limited to 4, and that's all I got. And 4 may not be enough to identify a thing at 600 yards, right? Mm -hmm. So, But that also means you're probably not shooting at 10. It's more for looking. Yeah. Uh, above 6, it's, it's all for observation in my experience because too narrow of a field of view, you don't see the next target, you can't track a moving target as easily, even at distance. Even if we were like trying to observe something moving at 500 yards, dialed up to 10, it's gonna be harder to watch where that's going at 10 power versus five. Now I know the audience is gonna ask, well why don't you just throw a red dot piggyback on top of the ACOG? Well, for one reason, I'm shooting a division called Partisan and I can't because my other gear took up my points right. and I couldn't have another optic on the rifle, right? So, but in the real world, let's go there, why not just throw a red dot piggyback on the ACOG? Um, you know, some people still do that, but modern uh, prism sights and combat optics have moved the, uh, the red dots either forward uh, on the uh, prism or combat optic because at the rear, it interferes with hats, it interferes with helmets, it interferes with night vision mounts. It stands very tall. Um, and having it further forward allows you, if you prefer the stacked at 12 o'clock method, allows you to do that. Now your ACOG is set up, so if you did want to do that, it would be at the rear. Correct. Um, this course, is an old school ACOG. Yeah. And of course, there is the offset method of you know putting one at, at 130 or um, 1130, if, depending if you're left or right-handed. Um, some people like that. Um, I think it really depends on how you're using the rifle, how useful that is, because a lot of times canting the gun uh, to shoot around things um, or the cant of the gun itself makes it uh, a little bit, le little bit less practical than having it mounted at 12. At 12, you can always shoot it off either shoulder. You can always shoot it around either side of cover. When you have it canted at a specific uh, left or right-handed offset, it makes it a little bit less useful. So I would say if you weren't worried about a hat or a helmet, or you weren't worried about a specific division requirement like partisan, putting a stacked RMR on the back of this, while it is largely a pretty big bore offset, I think it would have addressed the concerns that I have with, I could have done what you did at 1x with that. You might have, you know, even been more comfortable doing it because you had a straight up heads up shooting position mm -hmm. and you could have been more torso up shooting out the back of the truck versus I had to like kind of hunch over to get behind the gun. So in summary here, we'll get, get some conclusions. I'm going to put you on the spot. Is the ACOG obsolete? One. Uh, I don't think it's obsolete. I think it's very effective within its scope. Mm -hmm. um, you know, from a hundred plus, you weren't hindered really at all in this environment uh, to really what is the practical effective range of 5.56. Five, uh, the only times that you had a, a difficulty with it was shooting it under 100 yards. We had a few target presentations under 100 yards, some closer range steel at 50, and it was a little bit slower, but how much slower? We'd have to isolate those, those things to see how much slower it is. And the big one was the movement. So if I were to throw a red dot on this and not worry about the rules, 
what does what does the ACOG bring to the table that maybe that does not? Uh, probably mostly how much more compact it is. Mm -hmm. um, and we don't have a direct weight comparison, but just looking at it, I'm guessing that's you know significantly lighter overall on the gun than you know having a one to ten with a you know scout style mount on it as well. And not to throw shade on it on Sig or any LPBO for this matter, but that is definitely a more delicate piece of equipment. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the, the, one of the, the best things about the ACOG is how simple its mounting system is. You bolt two screws to the bottom, you don't have to level it, you don't have to worry about it coming uh, out of alignment in your rings. Um, it's funny, the, this particular SIG scope actually has a laser engraved line on the side of it, so you can always visually check if your scope is in alignment, and it's a quick and dirty way when you're mounting it to make mm -hmm. sure that it is aligned. So good on SIG for including that as a um, factory feature to address that concern. But, I mean, we've seen ACOGs get run over by trucks. Legit, literally run over by trucks. Um, yeah. You know, back in uh, 2009, when our guns got ran over at the Tiger Valley team match, uh, I had an ACOG that got ran over. Ran over. And it survived, there was no damage to it. Mm -hmm. um, your variable scope at the time broke in half. It broke in half, right where you would, right between the two bells. Yep, so. so. So this is a more complicated piece of equipment. It's got optics in it that move, and when you're turning that dial, that's why you're getting magnification. Mm -hmm. You have a diopter that requires focusing for certain magnification levels. Yeah. This thing, you just put it where you need it to be for your eyeball, and you're good to go. Yeah. You don't have to zero, you don't have to mess with magnification. You don't have to mess with any form of of uh, diopter. It just is. So you know everything's a trade off, right? Yeah. So like if you're putting together your end of the world apocalypse gun, I'd probably favor the durability of the ACOG over it. I would too. If I'm putting together a gun to try to juice the most performance out of it as possible. 1 to 10 LVPO is probably the way I'd want to go today. And I would still say that the ACOG, if you throw an RMR on top of it, achieves almost 98% of what you do with an LPVO with more durability, potentially without batteries, depending on the RMR you use. And it is something that will probably work for the rest of your life. <laughs> so I think that this is another one of those, it kind of depends. Things. Right. But the interesting conclusion to me at the end of this is the ACOG is very much still a very viable combat optic. I don't think it should be excluded off the list. Agreed. You know, even, even on the, uh, there were stages at this match where isolating the pistol portion out of it, mm -hmm. um, you got me by a few seconds on mm -hmm. with your ACOG versus my, uh, you know, top of the line modern optic, you know. So, um, you know, proficiency and skill with a particular system always, you know, trumps everything. So, so out of, outside of our, our match rules, I'll throw an RMR on that and do more with it because I, now that I've shot this again, I've kind of like fallen back in love with it. The ACOG brings a lot to the table. There's a reason it's a beloved optic. It has a, a historical track record of being effective optic. Throw the RMR on there, and um, I don't think you're leaving much off the table. So I think that was a very interesting conversation, and hopefully you all out there really enjoyed this conversation because this is the kind of stuff you only get to when you really do it. And on top of that, also want to thank you because uh, this is a Patreon-supported only project. In fact, this ACOG... I think it's from the beginning of InRange. I think it was purchased with Patreon money like a zillion years ago now. So this is a Patreon-supported optic. Um, and I want to thank all of you out there for doing that because no corporate sponsors, no overlords, literally just you, the viewer. If you can consider it, please do. Every dollar matters. Patreon.com slash TV. And if you can't, or already are, um, just subscribe to the channel and share with your friends because the YouTube algorithm being proactively demonetized does not favor this content. Thanks for watching.